The views expressed on the final straw radio do not necessarily reflect those of Asheville FM, Friends of Community Radio, or any of the affiliate radio stations airing the show. You're listening to WSFMLP 103.3 FM in Asheville, North Carolina. This is The Final Straw, and I'm William Goodenough. The show will later be archived at thefinalstrawradio.noblogs.org, and you can always email us with questions or suggestions at thefinalstrawradio at riseup.net. Also, if you are interested in rebroadcasting any episode or segment of the show, you're free to do so. Just send us an email if you do. If you care to, you can send us letters at The Final Straw, Care of Asheville FM, 864 Haywood Road, Asheville, North Carolina, 28806. The show is brought to you by Firestorm Books and Coffee. Located at 610 Haywood Road, Firestorm Books and Coffee is a worker-owned cooperative in Asheville specializing in offbeat, underground, and independent literature. You can find a sample of Firestorm's catalog of books and zines, plus a full calendar of events at their website, firestorm.coop. For this episode, we are featuring a conversation that William, that's me, had with some members of The Base, a social and political space in Brooklyn, about a book they co-authored called Burn Down the American Plantation, which outlines a potential revolutionary praxis that coincides with the history and present of black liberation, radical self-defense, building a revolutionary society, the formation of the revolutionary abolitionist movement, and many other topics. This book is just out from AK Press, and a free PDF can be found at revolutionaryabolition.org. But first, here are some announcements. Queer Cafeteria is a companion podcast to Fed Up Fest, which is a queer music festival in Chicago this year. You can hear your host, that's me, again, among many other folks, talk about class and queerness and transness, hear me swear a lot, and hear some really fantastic music from queer and trans artists from all over, singing about all sorts of the things that the kids are talking about today. You can hear this episode at soundcloud.com slash queercafeteria slash five hyphen class and hit up Queer Cafeteria on Facebook by searching the name. You can keep in touch with Fed Up Fest at fedupfestchicago.com. The Islamophobic right in the U.S. has called for a, quote, national march against Sharia, unquote, for June 10th, with knuckle-draggers in about 20 cities signed up to participate according to Proud Boys magazine. Needless to say, there will be opportunities for those of us with enough brain power to realize that the U.S. is in no danger of ever becoming a state run by Sharia law, and that this is nothing but a poorly masked call to increase violence against our friends, neighbors, and families of African and Asian descent, and who also may be Muslims. If you plan to oppose the Act for America events in your area, check out the article on antifascistnews.net to find the nearest one to you. It's suggested that if you're planning to attend, keep your identity safe, travel with friends, park away from the event, and share emergency information with your buddies beforehand. For those in Western North Carolina, Raleigh may be the nearest place of engagement. In the wake of continued violence by Islamophobic elements of the right, including the recent stabbing deaths of two and injury of a third anti-racist who stepped up to try to stop the harassment of two women of color wearing headscarves in Portland public transit, it's imperative for those who oppose bigotry in all of its forms and want to do something about it to take care of ourselves and know how to fight back. In this vein, stay tuned for our online release alongside this episode of our interview with organizers of the Haymaker Popular Fitness and Self-Defense Gym Pro Project in Chicago. Their Indiegogo campaign is nearing its end, so we wanted to help give it a little push and get them some more donations. In the interview, we spoke about building the muscles and self-confidence to fight off stranger attacks, as well as this project as an attempt to empower those struggling against intimate violence. We talk about queering, workout spaces, and concepts of violence. To check out more about their fundraising and watch their demo video, by finding you can find their page on Indiegogo by searching Haymaker Gym. This segment will become an episode in the near future. Also, June 11th is next Sunday, y'all. Check out June 11, that's june11.org, for a list of events in your area. We had announced a concert here in Asheville, but due to circumstances beyond our control, we'll be instead holding a vegan cookout at Firestorm Books and Coffee at 610 Haywood Road from 3.30 to 6 p.m., including presentations on prison realities for queer and trans folk, long-term eco- and anarchist prisoners' cases, and the history of the Green Scare. 
Alongside of this, we'll be showing the documentary Better This World about the frame-up on terrorism charges of Bradley Crowder and David McKay, two young activists, by the megalomaniacal former leftist turned right wing crackpot Brendan Darby during the 2008 Republican National Convention in St. Paul, Minnesota. But first, here are some words from anarchist prisoner Sean Swain. What you say, what you say, what you say, what? We're like a boy. Matthew Pearson Sr. is a former Marine who spent Memorial Day in debilitating and excruciating pain here at Warren Correctional Institution. While in the Marine Corps, Pearson seriously injured his knee. After getting discharged, he ended up in prison, which is easy to do in Ohio. For years, Pearson has attempted to get medical care from the prison system for his long-documented knee injury. Seven years ago, he was sent out for a consult at Ohio State University. The doctor who examined him, the state's own medical consultant, recommended an immediate knee replacement surgery that even set up the scheduling for the procedure to be performed. Pearson's been waiting for seven years. A bean counter for the prison system has decided that it's cheaper to make Pearson suffer for years and years than to follow the medical advice of the doctors they pay to provide medical advice. But the knee injury isn't just a knee injury. Unable to run or exercise, Pearson's health has seriously deteriorated over seven years. Also, the chronic pain has contributed to high blood pressure and other problems. Moreover, as the knee got worse and worse and the pain increased, the state cut back on the pain medications until Pearson now has to purchase his own Tylenol from the commissary, and it does absolutely nothing for him. At one point, Pearson even contacted the VA, who agreed to perform the surgery, and Pearson told the ODRC he would pay for the transportation costs. The ODRC refused, saying it would set a bad precedent to allow prisoners to get outside medical care. Care, by the way, the ODRC refuses to provide. Recently, completely out of all other options, Pearson filed a civil action for medical negligence in the Ohio Court of Claims. The way it works is, under normal circumstances, prisoners must exhaust the grievance process, which lets the prison fascists stall claims while terrorizing the prisoner intending to bring the claims, until he throws up his hands and surrenders. Not so with the Ohio Court of Claims. If Pearson requests $25,000 or more, he can bypass the grievance process and go straight into court. Also, because he requested more than $25,000, the prison system's in-house counsel cannot represent the ODRC. Instead, the case must be transferred to the Ohio Attorney General's office. And here's the best part. When the case goes to the Ohio Attorney General, the ODRC must write a check for twelve grand. That's right. Win or lose, just by filing the case, Pearson took $12,000 out of the prison system's operating budget. Reasonably, by filing an action and getting it in front of the assistant attorney general, Pearson figured the attorney general would see that he was recommended for knee replacement seven years ago and simply make a phone call telling prison fascists that the case is a loser and they should just replace his knee. No such luck. Pearson's case was assigned to assistant attorney general Gina V. Jacobus a ruthless and uncompromising wackadoodle who has pulled out all the stops to swindle Pearson out of the knee replacement he was ordered seven years ago. Jacobus has filed a motion to dismiss that's totally frivolous, just to tie the case in knots and avoid answering discovery. In short, the Attorney General is pulling every underhanded dirty trick possible in order to stonewall and make an honorably discharged veteran continue suffering excruciating pain. In fact, the Ohio Attorney General's office would rather spend thousands and thousands of dollars in costly litigation in an effort to avoid doing the right thing, rather than telling the prison fascists to order the knee replacement that would cost the state less than the litigation. Gina V. Jacobus, the Assistant Attorney General, spent her Memorial Day sticking it to injured vets like Pearson. This case is somewhat symbolic of the American method for addressing its veterans' problems. After Vietnam, large numbers of combat vets found themselves dumped into the prison systems, most often as a consequence of conduct that was symptomatic of their suffering, their inability to readjust to life after combat. Prisons became the cheapest way to put them out to pasture and neglect their real needs. 
Prisons are again being used to warehouse veterans returning from Afghanistan and Iraq, neglecting them and denying them medical and psychological care. And so, Pearson spent Memorial Day limping along on his cane while the Attorney General's office buries him in frivolous filings, trying to outlawyer him. Assistant Ohio Attorney General Gina V. Jacobus can be reached by phone at 614-387-4256 or by fax at 614-644-9185 or by email at gina.jacobus at ohioattorneygeneral.gov that's j-e-a-n-n-a dot j-a-c-o-b-u-s at ohioattorneygeneral.gov Hopefully the thousands of disgruntled combat vets who defended Native American land rights from the DAPL pipeline will let Gina V. Jacobus know what they think of her and will demand that Pearson get a new name. This is Anarchist Prisoner Sean Swain for more on corruption in Lebanon, Ohio. If you're listening, you are the resistance. You can write to Sean Swain at Sean Swain 243-205, Warren C.I., P.O. Box 120, 5787 State Route 63, Lebanon, Ohio, 45036. Updates on his situation and more writings by Sean can be found at seanswain.org. So I am here talking with two members of the base, which is a space in uh, Brooklyn, New York. Hi, y'all. Thank you all so much for coming on to The Final Straw. Thanks so much for having us. Yeah, thank you. No, it's a pleasure. Um, would you introduce yourselves and talk a little bit about uh, what you do and maybe a little bit about the base? Yeah, definitely. Uh, we've been involved in the base since the very start um, and organized there a number of different projects. Uh, we schedule a lot of like talks and programming and things like that. But for the last couple of years, we've been also running a few organizing projects out of the space. Um, and we can talk about that more and talk about the lead up to the book. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, I guess the base itself, we tried to make it to not stand as like a regular, say an info shop or something like that, but to try to use it as a really concerted, deliberate political effort that Mm. tries to change the dynamics in the city. You said, uh, social events and stuff. Does it do like shows and stuff like that? Or is it mostly, uh, sort of a political sort of space. Yeah, no, it's almost completely political. Every now and then we have like a, a social gathering, but it's almost always political. And it's also not the biggest venue, being mm-hmm. that like uh, things are so expensive here. It would be almost impossible to have a show, unfortunately. Mm-hmm. But yeah, we mainly almost exclusively do political stuff. Gotcha. And not that shows can't be political, just That's yeah. True. yeah. So yeah. Um, we're here to talk about the new book that came out from y'all called Burn Down the American Plantation, which uh, was released out from Combustion Books back in April of this year. And it is an excellent, excellent book. Can you describe it in your own words uh, and maybe what sort of led up to the the writing of the book, like interscene or political situations? Um, Awesome. Thanks so much. Uh, Yeah, so um, for the last few years, we've been doing a few different organizing projects through the base and reading groups, too. I think it was a combination of those two things that that led us to want to do this endeavor. Also, uh, the political context in New York um, before we opened the base was kind of continued. And uh, we felt that there was a lot of demos. Uh, A lot of people come to New York because they feel like it's a really big megaphone. So uh, they want to have a very big, spectacular demo. And and it's cool that that can happen. It can get a lot of recognition here. But then on the other hand, we felt that there wasn't a lot of continuity in the struggle. Um, And then that also led to a lot of like reactive dances where people were constantly on the defense for different issues. So that was one thing that we wanted to kind of fight against by making the base, like have some kind of continuity and build organizing projects. Uh, So for the last few years, we'd been doing a number of different organizing projects against gentrification. We ran a cop watch, um, had a number of different campaigns initiatives. Um, And those were all really good, but we also felt that it would be stronger if we connected them or connected the anarchist initiative with the history of the country and kind of 
found a continuity between some of the uh, liberation struggles of the past with what we're doing today. That's good. Yeah, yeah, I guess yeah, it kind of sums it up pretty well. But uh, yeah, I think also a lot of the ideas from the book came about from the Black Lives Matter movement in that like, well, well okay, let me back up. We studied a lot of things like uh, we studied a lot of Black Liberation Army texts, Black Panther texts, W.B. Du Bois, Black Reconstruction, and this is also around the time of the Black Lives Matter movement. So it's like it's almost impossible not to see the continuity from slavery to today and how the struggle and while it achieved a lot of things, the anti-slavery movement, it also like um, continues in so many ways. And we figured that um, and it would make sense politically to continue to position ourselves in that vein. Mm-hmm. Definitely. And when y'all were talking and sort of when I was reading the book, I was really, really connecting with it because we've been having a lot of conversations here in the South about sort of the like different nature of the fight that is being both being brought to us and that we necessarily have to bring to other people because of sort of the like changing relationship between like the far right and the far left if that makes any sense so like I think that this book is just like impeccably timed in history too with the political situation going on right now and I think it's a really useful text for for North American anarchists and maybe like for anarchists in other places as well. Thank you. I was wondering if you had any more words like if you wanted to just describe the book or give an outline of it or any anything like that anything that makes sense. Okay yeah we give a quick description. Uh, there's a few main overarching points that we try to hammer home in the text. One is that we argue that the Civil War uh, was never resolved, that it continues, and that the process during Reconstruction, the Reconstruction period, there was a counter-revolution that brought back all the all things that made slavery foundational. It all came back to being. And then it further gets consolidated through the prison industrial complex later. So from the 19th century to 21st century, you end up having black people still in chains as they were in the 19th century. So... Also, we argue that slavery was never actually abolished. It just transformed in the U.S. There are larger issues, too, that we argue, not larger, but other issues, I should say, that we feel that the revolutionary movements in the U.S. need to move beyond protests and move towards revolutionary resistance movements. And we use the Black Liberation Army as as an example of that in the split between the above ground and underground organizations from the Black Panther Party and the Black Liberation Army. And we use that as kind of like a model for what resistance could be in the U.S. and how we could get to a point where we stop playing from demo to demo and start planning for uh, the overthrow of the state. Mm-hmm. Yeah, some more? Um, yeah, so I guess the, what we were um, proposing is to follow that continuity uh, from the 1800s by uh, positioning what we're doing as the new underground railroad. Um, so the idea is there's a lot of people who are incarcerated or have the potential to be incarcerated uh, whether from ICE or whether from the uh, prison industrial complex and, and many other and many other forms. So that if, if uh, all these anarchist groups in their places are participating in that, are positioning what they're doing as an underground railroad, they're also at the same time building the informal or horizontal networks outside state institutions that has the potential to lead to a kind of a self-governance uh, structure. So we're kind of proposing that as a as a kind of conceptual and practical framework for our activities right now. Mm-hmm. Uh, and one last thing, too. We use uh, Revolution in Rojava as a paradigm for revolution in the 21st century, being that it's uh, anti-state feminist. And one thing that's also important is that um, while it's started from the Kurdish um, struggle, freedom movement, it also goes beyond nationalism, and they argue that it's not a revolution for Kurds, but a revolution for everybody, which we think you could make a, a similar argument for the black liberation struggle in the U.S. So, and I want to talk about all of that a little bit later, um, but the book opens up with a discussion of sort of the political moment that we have going on currently. And I feel like many people were pretty confused and alarmed by Trump's election, but the book, and you state in the book that he is a sort of like logical conclusion of the white supremacist political process w- that we have. Can you set the stage by kind of elaborating on this a little bit? Okay. Well, one thing that uh, that we want to get, I don't know if we detail this too well in the text, but um, 
there, it seems that every single time that there's resistance to white supremacist society, particularly from black people, especially because the country is rooted in a really foundational anti-blackness that uh, one author, Frank Wilderson, really talks about with the, the world in general, but the U.S. in particular. But every time there's a quest for liberation, there's a huge counter-reaction, which shows that the core of the country is white supremacist. So like, okay, you have the Civil War, and people push the country over the precipice, and then you have the Reconstruction period, which is detailed as one of the most progressive periods in U.S. history, where all these socialized like hospitals and public schools are created, and poor white people and black people start doing better in the South, and then there's a huge counter-reaction. The Klan rises from this period, and they start creating things like the Black Codes. The vice president, um, Andrew Johnson, goes on the war path around the country to try to give the planner class all its power back. And you don't have a lot of pushback, a sustained pushback from that to the civil rights movement. So in you, the civil rights movement, you have the rise of Malcolm X and the Black Panthers and the Black Liberation Army, and they try to push the country back over the precipice to get freedom for black people. In response to that, you have Nixon, you have the flood of drugs into the black community, you have uh, Reagan, and once again, you have this huge counter-revolution against that process. Then speed up to today, you have um, the Black Lives Matter movement, you have Obama, which I was, we all know, you know, fuck that guy, but it was something a lot of people in this country <laughs> weren't willing to deal with. And they're like, oh my God, a black man's at the head of the power, you know, we can't let this happen. And then you have the most incoherent, ignorant president in possibly U.S. history come into power. And you're kind of back to, once again, to where you were at this same trend that keeps coming back and forth. So it's not really, we didn't think it was surprising that Trump came in. It's pretty standard for U.S. history. It's just that at this period, the world is so unstable, it's probably more dangerous than it usually is mm -hmm. for uh, for people here and for the world at large. Definitely. And also, like, what also oh. struck me about the horror that people, at, at least like the liberal sort of left-ish folks were expressing, and even, even anarchists as well, was this question or this sort of situation of historical blind spots which which you also bring up in the book do you think that that maybe led to sort of the amnesiac sort of response to trump at least yeah i think that's definitely the case i think people don't really want to uh there's uh americans typically don't look too deeply into their own history to see how these things keep coming back up. I mean, I guess maybe I could talk about it from like our personal experience at the base. It yeah. might be a little bit easier, but Definitely. Um, okay. Because uh, we do, um, of course, in our course of our line of work, come up against a lot of people with liberal perspectives. And it's very interesting. You can see from their arguments that they're not really aware of like the deep racism in the country. And so <laughs> if people can move a little bit on that position, if they can acknowledge that there there is such a thing, then we feel like, okay, we can actually start having a conversation and start working towards something together. But a lot of people come in who you have a sense are either willfully ignorant or they're very happy with their comfortable position in liberal America. Um, so they don't really want to like uh, think that there is something wrong um, that will destabilize their, their worldview. So I think that, that maybe that's just like a very small example, but that might be a microcosm for the bigger picture that you're, you're talking about. Yeah. Yeah, and I think a lot of people don't want, they want to see it like if Trump leaves, things will be okay again. Mm. While it's like he's not really the larger problem, it's the core of the white supremacist society that is the problem that like liberal democracy sets up somebody like him coming to power, that like fascism usually comes in through some degree of popular support by uh, vile populists. Yeah, yeah. De definitely. So one of the book's major themes, which I found to be super right on, uh, is the analysis that like the Civil War and slavery never actually ended, which you mentioned a little bit before in the introduction to the book. Uh, if you have any other words to say about this, could you talk about it and how it relates to sort of the revolutionary model that y'all outlined in Burn Down the American Plantation? Okay, yeah, definitely. Um, yeah, so, so one thing we like to get across is that for making that argument, we didn't mean it as like hyperbole that like slavery never ended, but that it literally was codified into the um, one into the Constitution, and that after the Civil War, that the government did whatever it could 
to give it its foundational character back. For instance, with the black codes, they said black people couldn't walk around without having documentation. Without that documentation, they would end up back in chains in prison. In the 13th Amendment, uh, they make the argument that if if you are incarcerated, then you have you can be re-enslaved, that it's a legitimate form of enslavement. And that as you jump into the 21st century, you have a huge swath of the black population is now back in chains in pretty much the same exact conditions. And if you even look at like prisons like in Angola and Louisiana, around the country, the forms are exactly the same, where you have people pretty much on plantations working, people are chained all day. They're beaten and tortured for really small things. People have been scalped. There's, it's a bit quotidian in that like it's so normal that most people don't even really seem to think anything of it, which is why we think that it's like important to ground our work in there. That if people people make the argument, you know, if I was here at this period, I would do something. But it's like we're here now, and it's pretty much as draconian as it, as draconian as it can get, and actions have to be taken to stop this kind of social situation. Yeah. So that's kind of where we want to situate the text. Yeah, we also, okay, so you had a lot of resistance to slavery. You had like the Maroon Societies, which we felt was like a really inspirational form of resistance. They were, they had these fortified communities of uh, runaway slaves, of indigenous people. And in these communities, they fought against slave society, but they also did in a really decentralized, libertarian manner that a lot of people don't know about today. Mm. There's speculation that Nat Turner, for instance, was trying to flee from the, the plantations while he was pillaging and end up in one of these like fortified zones to launch attacks against slave society. And we figured that like um, it's kind of like an ideal to have like a decentralized, fortified place where you could attack the larger society, which we use as an inspiration. We also use like the black liberation struggle in the 60s and 70s. We think that's like the height of the revolutionary movement in the 20th century in the U.S. They had the most concerted effort to combat society where they replaced state institutions with things like the breakfast program and medical programs. Uh, they had like huge educational programs and centers all over the country, while they also had an underground network that was um, putting a lot of pressure on the government for lack of a better term. And this juxtaposition we found to be really the most important. We we're really inspired by one author and fighter, Russell Maroon Schultz. And in a text he has called Black Fighting Formations, he talks about how the Black Panther Party didn't have a strategy for dealing with a uh, war against the state. That while they had weapons and they had like a, a lot of people, by the time they were in conflict with the government, they were um, already too engulfed and didn't have a way out of it. So the Black Liberation Army, which was underground, had no way to recruit from the above ground organization, which led to their uh, demise, which was, qu I mean, they may have been like disrupted anyhow, but it happened sooner than it would have if they had thought it through. Mm -hmm. um, that's one of the lessons we want to take away. Yeah, that's super right on. I feel like there's always this conversation of, at least when I was coming up as an anarchist, like uh, 10, 12 years ago, there's always this conversation of like, the above ground versus the below ground and how to interface those two. And, you know, it's, it's a like sort of diversity of tactic conversation after a while that like both of those two tactics interface and intertwine with each other sometimes. Um, but I guess, you know, I, I really, I really liked the comparing and contrasting of the Panther party to the black liberation army in the book. I found it to be like super illuminating and, I was wondering if we could talk a little bit about self-defense because the book does a really, really good job of sort of laying a historical context, talking a little bit about like present day conflicts that are going on and also giving sort of suggestions for both long term and short term goals and how to lay sort of revolutionary foundations. And I really liked the discussion of self-defense as a revolutionary foundation. Um, and it's also it's also one of the major themes of the book. Could you describe the importance of this and also like the scope of the concept of self-defense? Because I feel like sometimes self-defense is used to only describe like a couple of kind of isolated praxis. And I was wondering if you would like explain what what you meant by by that concept. Yeah, so in general, we're feeling that we want to build up a kind of 
uh, revolutionary organs within the husk of the, the state right at the moment. But it's clear from um, the history of repression in the U.S. that that sort of activity won't be stood for if it, if it starts making headway. So we wanted to uh, center de- self-defense. And part of the reason why we talked about it first in that section is that we felt that any sort of gains that we make um, in building up uh, it also needs to be coupled with the, the requisite measures of defense so that we can protect the gains that we have. And uh, we also took a lot of inspiration from how it's practiced in Rojava, how the defense bodies are embedded with revolutionary values right in their core, and that to be involved in um, a militia or a local neighborhood defense group, that um, you actually uh, study the politics really deeply and are personally very involved in the decision-making practices of those defense groups, so that uh, being part of it is itself uh, part of uh, revolutionary practice, that people are kind of being able to articulate themselves in this way, also be able to protect very, very local gains. And of course, like, there are a lot of groups like around the country right now um, that understand the need for, for defense and are practicing it. Uh, Antifa groups around the country have gotten the opportunity to hit the streets for for better or for worse, (laughs) Uh, which is really, really exciting and encouraging that everyone is stepping up to the dangers of the present moment. But as we build, um, and if we have success in building um, our capacity, the right wing is really feeling itself right now. And of course, they're not going to want to see that happen. So it's very essential to tie anything that we, we build up, um, kind of like civic bodies and neighborhoods for self-governance, to keep it tied very closely with defense bodies that can make sure those, those gains can, can be kept. And by self-defense, because I, I, I have seen like a bunch of sort of grassroots organized kind of self-defense classes that's like, it, it's a self-defense versus a self-offense. Are you um, like advocating for sort of like a kind of self-defense that would necessarily in a way like replace like the need for police or the need for, yeah, like outside intervention for like, say, for example, homophobic or uh, transphobic attacks or misogynistic attacks? Or could you talk a little bit about like what is meant by self-defense or is it self-defense sort of in a broad general way? Oh, okay. I see. I see a little better what you're saying. Yeah, we're we're really proposing it as like the center for revolutionary practice. Um, maybe I can use a smaller example. Uh, at the base, um, we have fight training, and we're very clear in calling it fight training and not calling it defense um, because it is a slight a slight difference. So one is kind of positive out of a, a sense of fear of moving around the world, and the other one is positive as training for being on the offense, um, like you were saying. And then one of the central facets of the fight training that we do is that if people can fight well, they will be ready to defend themselves. So rather than being trained in specific situations, like, oh, if you're coming around the corner, if you have this and they have that, the idea is actually to be trained as an all-round good fighter. So whatever situation presents itself, you're prepared for it and you, you feel a little bit more protected in the world just by by knowing your own capacity. Um, so it's a really small example, a really small pragmatic example, but that's in general what we're thinking of for defense in a more broader revolutionary sense, mm-hmm. is that everyone is um, not preparing for the, the small scale particular situations, but preparing to be able to have kind of um, a broader way of defending themselves. And I think the Maroons um, were a really good example of this because they were consisted of escaped slaves, of indigenous people, mm. who are whites. Uh, they were based in a swamp. And by doing that, the people who were living in the maroons were trying to protect themselves from slave catchers, from the state. So they were, they were picking that location because they knew that they would be protected within it and they could live autonomously. Um, and then in addition to that, there were uh, armed patrols uh, that went around the perimeter to make sure that there wouldn't be any incursions from hostile forces. Uh, and eventually they would bond together uh, a couple of different maroons and have the requisite force to launch attacks um, on the state apparatuses because they did know that if they didn't take those apparatuses down, slavery would definitely continue and the plantation system would continue. So I think we kind of take that example for what we're looking at, that 
we know that there's a lot of groups around the country already that understand this deeply, and probably a lot of groups that are in the midst of very hostile right-wing forces, more so than, than we in New York are. And that uh, by connecting these forces kind of a little bit more um, politically, through the concept of the Underground Railroad, through the concept of building up a revolutionary force, that we can start thinking in that way of actually protecting the revolutionary gains that we have in very localized uh, situations and think about protection kind of in all, all, all facets of that. Definitely. This is actually one of the parts of the book that I benefited most from because I, as like a person, for whatever reason, and I'm not entirely sure why, feel like felt like somewhat resistant to the concept of self-defense. And this discussion of it in the book and hearing you talk about it just now, like gives me sort of a historical framework for thinking about it and also for like a revolutionary framework for thinking about it as well, because I think that anarchists in the United States and maybe the far left in the United States, as opposed to the far left in places like Europe, for example, are uniquely sort of divorced from our from our revolutionary and radical history. And that's part of the part, maybe part of the reason I was feeling that way. I'm not entirely sure why. But do you get any sort of that of that kind of reaction? I'm just I'm just curious, like, do you have to sort of talk up the notion of self defense with like folks that you're interfacing with? at the base or anything like that? Well, it's interesting because uh, after Trump came in, we had a huge swell in people coming to fight training. So at that <laughs> point, we didn't, <laughs> we didn't need to tell people why they should probably be training. <laughs> but unfortunately then, of course, uh, as people kind of settled into the normalcy of uh, having a, a lunatic government, <laughs> uh, even more so than usual, <laughs> the numbers did fall off. And, uh, you know, fight training is something that you can't really just do once or twice and be ready to go. It's something that people practice and, and train in for years to be able to, you know, do proficiently. So one of the things that I do like to talk to people about is that it's not just so you can walk around the world, but so that if somebody gets harassed on the train, if you see someone being attacked, um, like homophobically or whatever, that you would be able to step in and feel confident doing so. So that it's actually connected to kind of like a broader social initiative um, and not this kind of individualized uh, self-defense that you're talking about. Definitely. You've spoken about Rojava a few times. I was curious about the places like from which the book draws political examples, um, particularly Rojava. Would you talk about would you talk a little bit more about your reasons for including this comparison? Yeah, from what we understand, the uh, revolution in Rojava actually drew from the Zapatistas' model of self-governance uh, from the kind of ground-up councils. So that was really interesting um, for us that there was that kind of continuity. And the way we started seeing it as we studied uh, the Rojava revolution like more deeply is that from the Zapatistas to Rojava and then a few other armed groups around the world, uh, they were actually setting the stage for a new paradigm for revolutionary change that makes a lot more sense uh, with the, the anarchist modes of, of self-governance. Uh, so we began to study it more and more deeply, uh, meet people who had traveled there, and start breaking down each of the parts of society, how they functioned, how they were, how they were organized um, initially. And then we started looking at different ways that we might be able to institute that here. So for us, it was a huge boon because we could talk with people who literally had been involved in these processes. So for people starting from scratch, this was incredibly, incredibly useful. So in the book and kind of uh, the way we've been breaking it down in our own organizing work is looking at the components of self-defense, neighborhood self-governance in the form of the commune or council, how the economy works, uh, kind of cooperative-based economy, and how pragmatic feminism works in Rajava. Yeah, I'd also like to add too that I know a lot of people like have the idea that a place like Rojava, for instance, might feel like it's another world, it's another universe, but it's actually probably it's the largest and longest anti-state revolution in recent history. It's gone on longer than Spain. It's uh, more people are participating than even in Spain at its height. Yeah, it's one of the biggest things to happen in left history, in anarchist history, and probably 
forever. Mm-hmm. And it's like, yeah, you know, we think that people need to, um, you know, understand the scope of this and the scale and what it could, what it means for all of us as international anarchist revolutionaries. Mm-hmm. And like, I, to be clear, I really appreciated how y'all spoke about Rojava in the book because. In some anarchist texts, I responded a bit negatively to that because I felt that it was, you know, otherizing or tokenizing or exoticizing sort of the struggle that was happening in Rojava, and I didn't feel that that was going on here. Right now you're listening to William's interview of the folks from Burn Down the American Plantation. We're going to hear a little bit from the track they sampled on their video promoing the uh, the release of the book entitled Report to the Shareholders slash Kill Your Masters by Run the Jewels off of RTJ3. In the book, you sort of describe that the state is at a weak point right now. And that's something that I don't think I've heard anybody else say. Would you sort of uh, elaborate on that a little bit? Okay, well, uh, I think we're saying that what we meant is that, well, the U.S.'s global position has, uh, since the 70s, has been on a pretty steady decline. And it's probably due to... um, the incompetence of who's in the executive now is probably going to go on a really rapid decline internationally. And um, here, while there's getting more, it's getting more draconian, it's actually also getting more and more incompetent. Mm-hmm. So while you see like them calling for like, uh, you know, say the deportation of like 13 million people, they also haven't even put anyone at the head of ICE and they haven't hired anyone else. <laughs> it's like they haven't even, you know, started the process of uh, mechanically doing that. So it's like, I think they've had a thorough process of trying to like not educate people here. Like the public universities have been attacked. The you have things like Fox News that have progressively been just spouting propaganda and confusing people. So it's like the state it is tr- it is strong. It's probably one of the strongest states in the world, but it's also on a really fragile point, it's, which is why they're probably acting so ridiculously. So I think that's something to keep in mind that like when states start acting this this irrationally it probably means that their institutions are corroding and also if you look at public confidence of like say congress the media the uh, government it's like always polling around like 10 percent. like people don't really have any trust in any of these institutions anymore which means that it's a ripe time to start creating alternative institutions that can challenge these these structures yeah, yeah that is a totally excellent point did you have more to add on that uh, I guess we could also mention that the success of the Rojava revolution, from our perspective, comes from the very fact that it's organized in a decentralized, ground-up way, and that people are able to immediately influence all the institutions um, they're involved in, and that a lot of the, the primary groups in Rojava, such as Congreya Star, um, has really, really excellent anti-state analysis, 
and because there's so many people acting on this right now, they've had so much success militarily, I think that they're able to, to center anti-state organizing in a way that makes it very easy to take up by people here. Uh, we've seen a lot of organizers become radicalized from the Rojava Revolution. So their, their call for an anti-state social solution for, for federated communities becomes even more pressing and realistic, I think, because of all their successes. I spoke with somebody who attended a conference on Rojava recently, and they said that uh, one of the requirements for joining the YPG was that you had to take a six-week course in sort of anti-patriarchal pro-feminist thought, which I thought was incredible, especially if you're looking to, like, dismantle patriarchal frameworks. So, yeah, I agree with that, definitely. Awesome. (laughs) What I am curious about, and this isn't sort of a question that I sent to y'all, so before uh it's just one that's occurring to me right now is this issue of like i guess space perhaps is 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 a thing that i'm really curious about how do we interface with space in the u.s meaning like in rojava and as uh in like zapatista struggle there's all this space that's been seized back from sort of the state or, you know, been appropriated into the into the struggle in, you know, as as far as like, you know, going into the mountains and making a mountain sort of base goes. Mm -hmm. I remember reading this book, The Art of Not Being Governed by the anarchist anthropologist James C. Scott. And it's about like, this group in so called Vietnam, I want to say, struggling from sort of like, mountain communities and how to battle like statist infrastructures and how statist infrastructures really like inform and kind of rewire the human brain. And he is very clear in his book. And it's a really like spot on, really cool, inspiring book. But he's very, very clear that the world has changed so much that like what he is saying in the book isn't really relevant to how folks should approach like space-based kind of long-term struggles today. And I was wondering if you like just had any thoughts on the issue of, you know, how to approach space or how to approach, you know, this this topic. Yeah. One thing I think that like we learned from the Rojava revolution, well, it started around the same height as like the Arab Spring. Mm-hmm. So it was like uh this one YPG commander, we in this documentary we saw, he was talking about how um how they were wholly, they were fully supportive of the Arab Spring and all the movements that erupted then. And the, as we know, it started in Syria at the same time. But um, if you look at each of them, they've all been kind of quashed by reactionary forces, whether it's Tunisia, Libya, Egypt, Syria. All these like protest movements kind of dwindled away and were beaten back. And he was arguing that that in Rojava, they had a huge difference in that they prepared for the armed struggle. And that they're rooted in a guerrilla struggle and a liberation movement that had engaged the Turkish state and other states for many decades. So, like, they, they while other people were protesting, they were also preparing for uh, what would be a next stage of conflict. And when that next, when that seemed appropriate, they took action and they got space and territory and they could hold it down. And now they're kind of in a position that no one else has been in the world for a long time. So it's something I think that like revolutionaries in in uh, the u.s and latin america and europe should really learn a lot in asia should learn a lot about africa that like for instance here we we go from like occupy wall street to black lives matter before that you have the anti-globe period in the iraq war and we have these protests after protests after protests but we don't necessarily have the requisite strategic or infrastructural thought to move forward if the time ever presents itself which is kind of one of the points in the book that there are there come times when you can act and when you'll have a lot of popular support to act, but you have to have the wherewithal to do it. And they had the wherewithal to do it when it mattered. And now they're in a position that no one's really been in a long time. And I, I know it is really uh, difficult because we're living in the U S um, we have to deal with capitalism. Everybody has to go to work, maybe go to two or three different jobs, um, has a lot of bills to pay. 
And I see it in our organizing. It's really, really hard to mentally think of yourself primarily as a revolutionary and secondarily in your day-to-day life. Uh, and it's a, real, it's a real mental leap that's hard to make. And I can understand why if you have the ability as a revolutionary to, to go to the mountains, it's easier to see yourself in that way, even when you're participating um, in these other activities that you uh, might not agree with. So I think that that's a big question for uh, revolutionaries in the U.S. is to think about how to mentally go to the mountains mm. and participate in um, the kinds of organizing activities that we have to to do right now to prepare ourselves for for what's to come. And you you say so much about that in the book. There are so many themes that we like could speak about, but we probably don't have time for like conflict resolution, security culture, all these things. Um, and like uh, at that end, I was I was super impressed with the scope of the book. It's a really really slim volume, but it covers a lot of ground. Also, like I said before, it states like an explicit framework for the abolition of many things like ongoing slavery that centers black liberation and feminism in a way that I don't really think I've ever seen before. And like many props for that. Could you talk a little bit about a little bit more about your inspirations for the book and any other works or people that you sort of drew heavily from or were thinking about while you while you wrote the book? Oh, well, yeah, there's a lot of different authors and revolutionaries that we looked at. One, like we looked, we looked at Russell Maroon Schultz, as we mentioned before. He has a, a book called The Implacable Maroon that was really useful. We studied that. W.B. Du Bois's Black Reconstruction. Kowasi Balagoon, who was a Black Liberation Army fighter. We looked at a lot of his stuff. What else? We looked at uh, Frank Wilderson. We've been studying a lot of his texts. He's an Afro-pessimist author uh, based, I think, in California and a lot of his essays have been really useful. Then um, there's been like a lot. Uh, Alfredo Bonanno, the Italian insurrectionist, is really um, really important for us. The, the entire Rojava Revolution, Abdul Ocalan, all the revolutionary groups that come out of there. We studied a lot of their mm-hmm. stuff and the Zapatistas. It's been like a uh, numerous stuff. But then there's also like the the revolutionary movements in the U.S. that we've uh, participated in and had a lot of inspiration from it. I can also mention, too, that um, I didn't think we got, got a chance to say, but the riots that happened in Ferguson and Baltimore Word. were really inspiring to us. And it was really hard to watch them get suppressed and people have, having to go back to their day-to-day quotidian lives afterwards. So that was a really big motivator for us to, to think about ways to build up our movement so that people wouldn't have to go back to those lives, that we could actually have new kinds of infrastructure that people could join after the riot. And rather than like making you go through all the points in the book, the book sort of culminates in many different places throughout it in this sort of description of a revolutionary abolitionist movement. Would you kind of sum it up in whatever way makes sense for the listeners? Okay, so that's the larger call of the book. Well, we argue that the Civil War continues, that um, that slavery transformed into something different today, and that we could look at the revolution in Rojava as a paradigm for revolution here in the U.S. We can make a call for a larger revolutionary abolitionist movement around the country. Practically, we're calling for the, the establishment of a 21st century underground railroad that in many ways already has started to exist with ice raids amongst other things. And we think that, um, that revolutionaries and anarchists, we need to position ourselves as, uh, one taking part in that and two, um, giving it a political framework that could lead to a more liberatory outcome as opposed to just being like a palliative care being something that, um, can start building stronger communities of resistance and rebellion and uh, secondly, we're calling for a long-term uh, establishment of coordinated revolutionary anarchist abolitionist councils that take abolishing the state capitalism, white supremacy, and patriarchy as a starting point and also as a centering black liberation at its core and the idea of having councils and communes being the um, organizational models to replace these horrendous state infrastructures and, and capitalist infrastructure. It's it's such a big concept. It's like, I, yeah, I really appreciated, again, like how thorough the book was in sort of expressing long-term and short-term goals. Like, would you 
just talk about maybe a f- one or two of sort of like long term or short term goals that like come to mind for you? Oh, I can actually mention that um, we were initially inspired when we uh, started the base to integrate kind of the Black Panther style social services with anarchist politics. And that's something that we're still trying to, to do today. So we're looking at that way of establishing the Underground Railroad as a kind of combination of those two things. But what we're hoping, I think, in the short term is to start connecting with other anarchist groups and Antifa groups around the country who see this as a good way to move forward. Mm. For our own organizing, we're hoping to carry this forward here in in Brooklyn and start building out these kinds of uh, services, the Underground Railroad, defense networks uh, with this political basis and start developing forms of organizing with each other that's really proactive like we were kind of talking about before, mm-hmm. um, and that re- that stretches out into into broader society, so that more and more people can be involved. Yeah, I also like to add that, like, to be a revolutionary, like, okay, how should I put this? That it's one thing to like claim solidarity with people, and it's another thing to have the same fate or the same struggle as people who are who are fighting and who are being oppressed. So as like the state becomes more and more draconian as they're trying to ethnically cleanse essentially Latino people, that instead of like, that we could do more than say just having protests, but we could actually, or we need to, and should begin immediately trying to help people out of these uh, situations. Mm -hmm. So when people say are fleeing an ice raid, it's, we could help them stay out of like state captivity when uh, people are, you know, out of prison or even on parole, it's, we could help them, you know, to, um, lead better lives to stay away from the state to get out of the the state's hands and then through like processes like this we can start building a stronger revolutionary culture that can one can bring in new people people who are um dealing with the forefront of of state violence and it's through connections like that that we could uh really begin to start combating the state in a long-lasting way definitely i definitely couldn't agree more with that did you have anything else to add about that topic uh, well, there's one other thing, too. One thing for, uh, I guess this is also a short-term thing. On the, We have a website now for the Revolutionary Abolitionist Movement. It's revolutionaryabolition.org. We have a section on there that says um, if you need help setting up some infrastructure, uh, if you contact us, we could probably help arrange to get somebody to come to your town and help you set up things like uh, maybe websites and like uh, different things to help you get started. Um, yeah, so if you contact us, we like to try to help people around the country get started so we can start coordinating ASAP. That's so excellent. The, that, those were all of the questions that I had written out, and there's so many topics in the book again, but I was wondering if you had anything to add that you wanted uh, to be in the interview. Um, I guess uh, one little message made it go away with is that like when, when we read like all of these historical figures, we read about like uh, Malcolm X or Kwesi Balagoon or you know, anyone, Daruti, it's, uh, I think people should realize that these people aren't, like, uh, figures, but they're just people who just, you know, who had a certain level of passion, so, like, any of us could be doing these things and should be doing these things, so, you know, mm. now is the time to fight back while the state's getting more reactionary, while fascist groups are on the prowl, it's our time to put up, so, mm-hmm. so we'll see you guys in the streets. Definitely. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> Thank you guys so much, this was a total pleasure to talk to you about this excellent book and they yeah thank you all so much it's been great oh thank you so Thanks. much thank talk you so you much soon. for the support yeah talk to you soon and that was our interview with members of the base for a full pdf of the book as well as contact information should you want to contact some folks you can go to their website revolutionaryabolition.org you're listening to Asheville fm and Asheville, and this is the final straw